for uh, z minus 1 on z minus i uh, to be real. That's the first one that I'm doing. So I'm going to write to be real. What we need to say is that the imaginary part of z minus 1 on z minus i, that has to be 0. Now, um, I can see, because I separated out in the previous um, part of the question, this right here, this is the imaginary part of z minus 1, z minus i. So all I need to do is solve for this thing being equal to 0. Now I hope you can agree that it doesn't matter what the denominator is equal to. As long as the numerator is 0, then the whole thing will be 0. So therefore I can say, i.e. x plus y minus 1 equals 0. And I can just tidy this up a little bit, make y the subject, I guess I would subtract x, add 1, and amazingly I get this very very simple shape. It's just a straight line with a gradient of negative uh, 1 and a y-intercept of 1. Now this looks really good, um, but there's a bit of a problem. Um, there's something which we kind of ignored early on which we need to draw our attention back to. If you have a look at this original question, right, we want z minus 1 on z minus i to be real. And it's a bit sneaky here because we haven't really been thinking in these terms for a while, but this expression here, it actually has a discontinuity built into it. There is a value that z is not allowed to take, otherwise the universe of mathematics explodes. What is that value? Maybe my, uh, my sort of introduction to it might be able to tell you, right? This denominator here, z minus i. Z minus i can never be zero because you can't divide by zero. We have learned in complex numbers, you can take square roots of negative numbers, still not allowed to divide by zero. So that's a way of saying z minus i cannot equal zero. But we could equally write that as z cannot equal i. Now the reason why this is important to me is because that number, that complex number i, is actually going to be on this line here. Because if you think about this, let's actually draw it now. If you think about what uh, y equals uh, minus x plus 1, what it looks like. Uh, as we mentioned before, it's got uh, a y-intercept of 1. That's on the imaginary axis here. Uh, in fact, that makes its intercept i. So uh, I guess we have to say that this point i is normally would be on, you know, considered as part of the locus here, uh, locus I should say, but we had to exclude it due to this domain restriction that was implied by the question itself. So therefore I've got uh, a big hollow circle there and now I can draw the rest of my uh, locus. So there goes the line with gradient negative 1 off to the left and to the right. You can see we should get that intercept there at 1 uh, and you can test this, uh, this locus out, right? If you put in a spot like z equals 1, you get 1 take away 1 on 1 take away i. Well, you get 0 on the numerator, so therefore 0, is that a real number? Yes it is. You can test some less trivial numbers if you want. Uh, for example, if we go over to say here, so I'm going to call that 2. Um, this down here means if you have a look across, because we know the gradient is negative 1, that should be negative i down there. So therefore, if we test, um, I'll just write it over here, test z equals 2 minus i. I'm going to pop it into uh, this z minus 1, z minus i over here. Let's try it out. I'm going to get uh, 2 minus i minus 1 divided by uh, 2 minus i minus i. What do we get here? Well, 2 minus 1 gives you 1. There's no other i's on the numerator. On the denominator, you get 2 minus 2i. And you can clearly factorize out this 1 minus i factor on the denominator, or you can factorize out a 2. So that gives me 1 minus i on 2 outside of 1 minus i. So cancel, cancel. We just get a half, which is indeed a real number. And you can check anywhere else along this line, so long as you don't include i, because it leads to this discontinuity, you are fine, okay? So that was part A for it to be real. Now I want to do part B, um, which is for it to be imaginary. Now, for z minus 1 on z minus i to be imaginary, um, we can use the same kind of logic that we employed before, which is to say, um, I want the real component over here, I want that to be equal to zero. So I'm going to write that down first. Um, the real part, z minus 1 on z minus i, that has to be definitely equal to zero. 
But I've already kind of flagged for myself that this is not the only thing you must consider. For instance, um, we're gonna have this same domain discontinuity that we had before, that's a bit of an issue. But in addition to that, you can see if I want z minus one on z minus i to be imaginary, there is a single case in which even though the real part is zero, you still might not get an imaginary number. And that is if the real part is zero and also if the imaginary part is zero. So this is a bit sneaky, right? When you have a look up here, right? If the imaginary part is zero, what you get left with has to be a real number, okay? But if the imaginary part and the real part are both zero, then you're just looking at zero. That's not an imaginary number. That's a real number. So therefore, I have to say, um, there's actually a problem, not from the denominator, well, there is a problem for the denominator, but there's also a problem from the numerator. Um, I can't let the numerator equal zero because that would not be an imaginary number. So I am now also excluding, in addition to excluding z equals i, I have to exclude z equals one. So from there, now that I've noted my domain discontinuities, um, because I, was, it's, I sort of flagged it earlier on, I then have to look at this part here. You remember, if the numerator is zero, the whole thing is equal to zero. So I'm gonna take this. Um, and so long as I solve for this being equal to zero, and note my other discontinuities from before, I should get, um, I should get the right locus. So let's have a look at this. What shape is this? Well, it's not immediately obvious, but I do notice that there's a, a, a positive x squared and there's a positive y squared. So um, where my brain is going is, I think I should complete the square. That will help it make, more, make it more obvious what kind of shape this is. So if I gather over here, x squared minus x, to complete the square on this term, I have to take this coefficient here, which is negative one. I have to halve it and square it. Halve and square. So when you halve it, you get um, negative a half, and when you square it, you get a quarter. You do the same thing uh, for the y's, so because the coefficients are all the same, so you add a quarter here. Now because you added a quarter to the x terms and you added a quarter to the y terms, well I did anyway, um, you're going to have to add it to the right hand side as well. So a quarter plus a quarter, um, I might as well actually just write a quarter plus a quarter and we'll simplify on the next line as a half. In exactly the same way on the left hand side, I can do some more simplification here. These two sets of brackets, these trinomials, they're perfect squares. They don't look like it because they're fractions, but they are perfect squares. It's x minus a half squared. Remember, this is the thing that we, we, um, we, we halved it and got to here, and you square it to come up to this if you were expanding. So same deal over here. It's y minus a half squared. So this is just a circle. Um, I know where its center is. It's a half plus a half i, and then I know what its radius will be. It's gonna be uh, the square root of this, which is one on root two. So let's go ahead and draw that. So I'm gonna draw this over here. That looks like a decent looking set of axes. And then I've got a circle. Now, uh, think about this for a second. Um, we said that you're gonna have a, um, a center of a half, plus a half i, right? So therefore, uh, my center should be about there. But then, because I have a radius of um, one on root two, you have to think about where, are there any, gonna be any relevant um, intercepts, right? And there is, or there are, I should say. Um, if you have a think about going from this point here, this point, I should actually label it, a half plus a half i, what will be the distance from this center to the origin, what will be the modulus of that central point? Well, you can see, I hope, that because this distance is a half, and this horizontal distance is also a half, using Pythagoras, you can confirm for yourself that you're going to get um, one on root two as your hypotenuse. So therefore, since that's the hypotenuse, and that is actually the radius of the circle, because this is equal to one on root two all squared, right? Um, the circle is actually going to, its circumference is going to pass through um, this, this origin over here, because that's one of the points that's the, the right distance from the center. So therefore, I'm gonna just roughly draw this and then I'm gonna fix it up. There we go. Obviously, I'd use like an actual compass or something like that if I was doing this uh, accurately, but I think maybe it should be a bit bigger. There we go. That's not, that's not too bad. I think that's, uh, that's close enough for me. So there's my circle and it has um, the correct radius and the correct center. I actually feel like it should be a little bit bigger, but you get the idea. 
there we go, I'm, I'm more happy with that. Um, it goes through the origin, as I pointed out, um, but you can see here that I need to exclude these two points that I noticed before, right? Where is Z equals I? Well, Z equals I is, if this is, uh, if this is half I, then I is up in this corner over here. So therefore, I need to put a hollow circle at I. And let's, um, let's go over that so you can see it's truly hollow, okay? Um, and in the same way, I need to put in a hollow circle at z equals one, which is down here in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and I can see that that should be the right scale. So I'll just fill that in. So this point over here is one. They are not included, but every other point on the circumference is. Ah, so <laughs> what's, what's our conclusion? Um, you had to do quite a lot of thinking to get through this question. Firstly, you had to um, convert this into an appropriate form. We realize because of the separation of real and imaginary, and also because we're sketching, that Cartesian form would be most useful to us. We had to do a lot of work um, once we got it into Cartesian form to separate out the real and the imaginary parts. And then if you want reals, you need no imaginary bits. If you want imaginary, you mean no real bits, but you also need to be quite cautious because of these, um, these hidden domain restrictions that we noticed, um, first from the denominator, but then even from the numerator, if you want a number to be imaginary, zero is not allowed. So I hope that's helpful. Think carefully, draw your diagrams nice and big so you can do your geometric reasoning on the diagram as you've seen here, and you'll be able to tackle questions like this in the future.